Okay. All right, I'll go ahead and get started here. So um, this one is the other star topic that we've been working on. So uh, one of the things that, you know, kind of caught us a little bit by surprise, um, you know, last year, well, uh, over the last year or two, is the, you know, the requirement for viscous coupling in all these panel method type solutions. And I think, I think you know, probably Dave, uh, you know, will agree with some of the, some of the statements I'm going to make here. Um, Flight stream does, you know, has the ability to do, you know, like thin surface stuff. Like, you know, we do that with propellers all the time, uh, just like VSP Aero does. Okay, so that's that's a, that's a common starting point. But when you get to some of these more complex configurations that have to be done in thick mode, uh, thick surfaces and panels, uh, viscous coupling ends up becoming a critical factor. And allow me to explain why I'm talking about that. Um, so what I'm going to do here is actually just give you a, you know some summary, some technical summary of how we have implemented viscous coupling inside Flightstream. We did this as part of a, a NASA uh, SBIR phase two extended activity because you know it turns out that you you know we, we have some flow separation capability and other stuff in Flightstream, but you really need viscous coupling in order to start get improving the fidelity level and matching closer with CFD style results, right? Um, so let me let me explain what the the key ideas here are. So uh, this slide will actually just be an overview of what's there in flight stream okay so we do an inviscid solution you know based on you know these uh, distributed uh, distributions of surface vorticity okay which is essentially just a one step beyond a piecewise constant uh, you know like a vortex ring type approach um, we had a all this while an integral boundary layer method implemented in flight stream but this was done in a uh, decoupled manner. So you do the inviscid solution, then you do the integral boundary layer calculation and use that to compute things like boundary layer drag, etc. There is no coupling between the solver and the and the boundary layer. Okay, and we weren't focusing on that. Um, and then we had these uh, the separation models based on you know the relaxing the Kada condition based on where separation happens and moving the wake upstream, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And some of the stuff we've discussed in previous presentations. So I won't I won't dig too much into that here. And then we focused on things like fast multipole uh, for for performance speed up and uh, you know all that stuff. So we kind of went down a certain developmental path here, and we didn't think too much about viscous coupling. Where that comes to bite us is you know in this plot right here. So this is the plot on the X fifty seven, okay. And on the X fifty seven, what's interesting is that the guys uh, at NASA could have this airfoil that they're using, and it's got a very high cusp trailing edge cusp on the back. And it's got a blunt trailing edge. I mean, we, we can handle blunt trailing edges in flight stream. That's not an issue. But that cusp means that uh, the very high camber means that even at zero degrees, the last 20, 15, 20 percent of the airfoil is fully separated. OK, um, and this is not your classical stall bulk separation happening. This is actually your boundary layer separation. happening. OK, and the, 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 there's big differences between the two, the physics wise. Um, and so what happens is that you end up getting a plot that looks like this, where if you take the, uh, the so the red red data points is what the Langley guys ran for the X57 using Fun 3D. OK, and this is like the CL uh, of the configuration minus the CL of the stabilizer. So essentially the CL of the wing, right? Um, and then as a function of angle of attack. And then the yellow line is what you would get from a tool like Flightstream, now with the solid model, okay? So what's happening is that, you know, um, we are essentially modeling the thickness effect of the airfoil, but we're not modeling the thickness effect of the boundary, which means we always end up over predicting. OK, so even though we predict the stall and stuff at 14 to 16 degrees and some of that stall behavior, you could argue is reasonable. The fact is that there's a big difference between where that yellow line is and where the red data is. Uh, if you try to do a thin wing approximation, OK, which is just go back to the mean camera surface like the Degen Geom stuff in BSP. OK, we get something that looks like that purple line. So what's happening there is that you're eliminating the thickness effects, but you also don't have the boundary layer thickening effect and the two missing physics kind of cancel each other out. And so your, your, you know, your net answer is closer. And so we end up in this bizarre situation where the user goes and runs flight stream and says, hey, I ran a full solid solution. Why is my answer worse than what I would get if I just did a, a thin surface vortex lattice method? Okay. And so the, if the answer to that question is viscous coupling. OK, the, it's, a, it's surprisingly substantial for some of these configurations. So uh, and for things like blended wing designs, this means that at even at zero degrees angle of attack, you know, you could be over predicting by 20, 30 uh, percent if you're not careful, just because of how thick the boundary layer gets on those uh, those full scale configurations. So that was our, that was the intent today. So is, I said, OK, well, we should be able to address this problem, right? Um, so we, uh, here's a summary of what we have in Flightstream for the boundary layer. 
Okay, so as I said before, we already had a integral boundary layer model that was set up for compressible subsonic flow. And this is the work done based on the model developed by Standen. Okay, so I've linked the paper down there. Okay, and so essentially we are solving for these, you know, these differential equations and getting all the relevant boundary layer information out. Now we, we use this for computing things like velocity profiles and the CD naught or the, uh, the skin friction drag coefficient, et cetera. So we don't, you know, we're not doing like, you know, like a, a Reynolds number kind of model for, for the, the drag, although we have that as an option if the user wants it. Um, and we do that based on calculations based on these surface streamlines that get computed. So the picture on the left is the, uh, the D8 model and flight stream, right? So, um, um, those surface streamlines is what you you know what you have, and we compute all, all this information. So we have the full history for the boundary. Layer. So then, you know, and, and this part actually has been uh, you know very nicely validated as well. So there's a lot of data out there between X foil. So I mean, if you look at some of the viscous coupling stuff in X foil, I mean, you know, you can actually do a 2D analysis in flight stream and uh, do you know compare the uh, the results from our model against the data, both experimental and X foil data, and it's pretty reasonable. Okay, so that's not the issue. The issue is what do we do as far as coupling goes? So for coupling, you know, we looked at two different approaches and this is again, nothing new here. I mean, I'm not, uh, this is not proprietary stuff or anything. It's, it's there in a lot of publications, but there were two approaches. One was, what if you modify the surface of the geometry by displacing the, you know, like the, displacing the dividing streamline essentially that, or thickening the surface, so to speak, uh, by actually accounting for the boundary layer thickness. Um, you know, or the other approach, which is the, you know, the normal blowing boundary, which is kind of, I think um, Mark Drella has an implementation of this, I think some uh, in x -Foil. I may be wrong, but um, I, think, I think that's the case. Um, and so the, the, the second example is where you keep the surface fixed. So your, your original mesh that came from BSV and stuff is not being distorted to account for the stuff. And then you modify the boundary conditions. So we looked at both, okay? So we looked at the, the dividing streamline approach and the idea here was you compute the boundary layer, you know, you compute the inviscid solution, compute the corresponding boundary layer solution. Um, you inflate, quote unquote, inflate the uh, surface mesh by the thickness of the boundary layer. You solve for the next iteration, repeat until converge. Okay, so that was the, uh, the, the strategy there. The second one was uh, the normal blowing boundary. So compute the in initial inviscid solution and the boundary layer compute the um, displacement by the, uh, you know, compute the displacement, you know, uh, thickness of the boundary layer inside the boundary layer code, and then compute the normal blowing velocity, okay, using the equation that's shown here, um, you know, modify the boundary conditions, resolve, and repeat until converge. Okay, so so these were the, the, the two strategies that we followed. We eventually ended up cho choosing the normal blowing boundary because it's a lot less hassle and a lot less risky to modify boundary conditions than it is to modify mesh, especially based on flow solutions. Okay, um, and I think uh, for those of you who might be interested in implementing this into your own, you know, codes and stuff, in-house codes, uh, that's a lesson to be taken away. Is that you know, be warned that <laughs> mesh morphing is tricky. Okay, um, so. We also then looked at, you know, we wanted to make sure that the performance of the solver doesn't suffer. So one of the things we do is that we implemented uh, spatial trees, uh, similar to how you do the fast multipole methods inside the viscous module, so that the search tree around the, you know, around a given location. Okay, so on the right, for example, you see the standard kind of like fast multipole type oak tree uh, like computation, but then this green one is what you get when you have the similar one implemented for the the boundary layer in the local boundary layer coordinate systems. So you can see essentially the thickness of the boundary layer as it expands. And we use this to do the spatial calculations for which points are inside the boundary layer, which points are not, and what the modification of the boundary conditions needs to be. Okay, so essentially doing it this way, you generate a very fast sorting uh, of points. Okay, so you know the speed wise, there's a very little impact. Uh, there's a, about a 5% increase in, in the memory footprint because if you do the viscous coupled solution for this reason, because you're having to do this additional data structures. Uh, but overall, it means that you know, you, your uh, performance is you know, roughly not affected. And so you're paying a 5% penalty on memory, but you're gaining a lot in terms of the uh, fidelity of the solutions, as you'll see. Um, and then, so on the solver side, um, I've kind of put in a, a flowchart that tries to illustrate how this viscous coupling works, right? So we have the um, 
the geometry inputs, all the stuff coming from BSP and stuff goes in here, or you know, or CAD or any other source that you would like, okay, goes inside the UI inputs. We have the standard flight stream solver, that's the blue box there, okay? And then we have this viscous coupling module, okay, where we are essentially linking uh, the integral boundary layer calculations with our flow separation and our relaxed cutter routines, you know, for the, uh, for the vortex shedding stuff. Okay, so, all, you know, all of this put together means that you end up with something that looks like this. So going back to that X57 case, you end up in a situation like this, where you know you have the same same plot as before. The red dots are the um, you know are the um, um, uh, the fun 3D results. The purple points are the uh, original flight stream result, the, the inviscid flight stream result, and then the yellow line is what you get now with the viscous coupling enabled. Okay, so looks better. I mean, there's still some improvements to be done here and we're working on those, but it looks pretty good. Uh, the drag on the on the right hand side looks pretty good as well. So this is something that I mean, you know, gives us reason to be hopeful that this is, you know, we're that we are addressing this using a physics-based solution, right? So we are modeling the thickness, but we are also modeling, modeling the effects of the boundary layer. Um, we did some testing on this actually with, uh, you know, so this is a, a, you know, obviously we are always strapped for resources as a small company, so I rely on, uh, you know, user participation as much as possible. And so on this one, I, you know, I, you know, there's some student graduate students working at the um, University of Naples, and what they did was they actually ran some, you know, the, some of these geometries which are representative of these. Um, DEP style wings where the viscous coupling is significant. And uh, they did this with uh, compared, you know, generated the data using star CCM plus for the CFD side. And so they ran this, uh, the CFD solver both in viscous mode, the standard RAN solution, and then they ran it with the, um, with just the, you know, the inviscid mode, the Euler mode. Okay, and I think the results are pretty interesting to look at. So this is just a, a standard wing. I put in the numbers here for the key parameters that went into the, uh, the actuator models and the results. But then you know uh, you get something that looks like this. So on the left hand side, you can essentially see. Um, so the red data points is the classic Navier-Stokes solution. Okay, the gray data points are the Eulerian solution using the same Navier-Stokes solver, but with, with the viscous stuff switched off. And so the original yellow, uh, these original black line over here, are the yellow dots up here, okay, matching with the gray line, that's the standard flight stream solution. And you totally expect this because. You know, you're essentially once you switch off the viscous stuff in the RANs, your your Eulerian solution is the same as your potential flow thick panel solution. Okay, and so so there's no surprise there that you know that was what we were getting before. Okay, but with viscous coupling now we end up getting this over here, which is a huge improvement than what we had. Okay, um, similarly because you're now able to account for the boundary layer coupling, what it means is that the boundary layer itself feels the effect of the, uh, the modification to the inviscid boundary, which means that the the thickening of the boundary layer, especially towards the trailing edges where it gets to exponential levels, um, that gets accounted for, which means that the drag prediction at higher incidence angles also is a better match than what we would otherwise get, like these gray data points back here. Okay, so it's not just a you know, one way effect where the boundary layer is affecting our, our CL calculations, but it's two ways. So we also get an improvement in drag when you do it this way. Um, so, and then, you know, this is the same case, but with the propellers switched on and off. So uh, here, the gray data point and the red data points are basically the star CCM plus solution uh, with the propeller on and off. And then the, uh, the orange data points of the flight stream solutions, propeller switched on and off. So, you, you know, so it's a, it's a much better match than uh, what we traditionally get. Okay, so then we went into and you know and wanted to test this for uh, the high end side of the um, uh, the high lift uh, kind of geometries. Okay, and we, so one of the things we are doing here is that the guys up at Naples are working on their tool called JPAN. Okay, and so uh, they, I think they have a, a company set up called Smart Up Engineering. And so one of the things they do is the, the JPAN, which is really uh, kind of interesting. And I think it would be good for BSP to also support this. I think at some point is the, this inset picture that you see here the level of fidelity that is you know provided for high lift devices mm -hmm. and on the flight stream side we can accept these models so like in other words if somebody went and made this in cad we could load it up in flight stream and we have the uh, proximity and near field stuff in there so that you can handle these narrow gaps and everything um but i think in bsp uh, it's kind of a little bit more tricky to come up with these kind of designs than than you know than it should be and i think that's that's something that we should definitely talk about some more 
uh, for you know for future enhancements. But anyway, so for this one, we kind of had some data, and so we you know they used the uh, uh, you know the tools that they had in house to make this geometry. And so this picture on the on the left hand side is the mesh that we generated for this geometry on the flight stream side. So very similar to what you would do in VSP, same best practices, etc. Uh, except like I said, the the refinements that you see at the um, at the locations where the high lift uh, flap merges in. Okay, so um, by the way, I should mention that the, the stuff that they're working on in JPAD is kind of interesting because they actually export both to uh, uh, OpenBSP and FlightStream. So it's actually a two-way street where their tool can actually write the VSP file and also interface with FlightStream. So it's, uh, you know, for, for high lift devices, it makes it very compelling because you can, you know, you can move between VSP and stuff uh, and FlightStream and uh, add some of these other things if you need to. Okay, um, so what I you know, so what we did then was uh, same same scenario as before, uh, tested it with Star CCM Plus, and so um, here we have the CL versus Alpha. So I mean, again, you can see the uh, the gray line up here is what our standard flight stream solution would have given us, okay, and then the orange line is what we get now, and the purple line is the pure Euler solution uh, from the uh, Navier Stokes code. Okay, <laughs> I mean it's kind of like an oxymoron, but you know what I mean, like the CFD code without the viscous coupling. Okay, um, and so, and the same thing. And what's nice also is um, you end up getting nonlinear moments, which is uh, which was a nice revelation to me. Maybe it's quite obvious to uh, those of you listening, but the thing that I was surprised by is that we're so used to seeing like linear CL, you know, like moment curves that with viscous coupling, you end up getting a very nice, you know, curvature to the moments, very similar to what the, the CFD code is picking up. Small differences in CL over here will mean huge differences in these curves, okay, just because of how moment is you know sensitivity wise but uh, nonetheless it was it was very um, uh, encouraging to get this um and then as i said you know going back to the blended wing body design i found on the vsp hanger the um you know the n2a blended wing body from i think vsp version 2 i guess way back in the day and so i downloaded that and turns out that the carp 3d guys had published a very nice paper describing the run condition so i could use that to do some testing on this and just ran this um you know configuration i mean the the nice thing about this is that you know with the VSP model already there, it was literally like a, a, a three-step operation: go into flight stream and like you know because it's it's a blended wing, everything has a trailing edge, right? And so the runtime is on measured on the order of seconds on this one. It's really quite fun to see. But um, anyway, so and in terms of results with the viscous coupling and all enabled, I mean it looks pretty promising. I mean I, I put in here the blue line, which is the uh, the car 3D results. So that's the the linear solution they have. I want to say that CARP 3D has some kind of viscous coupling. I know they were talking about that a couple of years ago, so they may have already fixed this. So if you're a CARP 3D user, please don't be offended. I was just using the uh, the, the data that was there in the paper that I, that was available to me. Um, anyway, um, so I you know I plotted also the uh, the moment results, and what's nice again is that you know you end up getting that kind of bend in the moment curve that is uh, quite quite you know need to see. Okay. Um, one of the final things I want to mention, I'm just checking the time. I think I have time. So I just wanted to mention a couple of slides. One of the byproducts of all this is that we ended up putting in such, uh, some visualization tools so that you can actually see what the boundary layer is doing. OK, and so we added the ability to have just like CFD, except only for post processing in our case, uh, the ability to put in a volume section with prism layers. OK, and so, uh, you know, and then you can put in growth rates and other things, because we, since you are, we, are, we now have a boundary layer model that has the, so, you know, that has the ability to plot a velocity profile. Uh, we went and checked what uh, Mark Grella did with uh, some of the some of the original work from the 80s. And there's some papers that talk about velocity profiles that show, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the post separation velocity profiles. And since we know where separation is happening in the boundary layer, we can implement all. So in other words, you should be then able to see what the boundary layer is doing, just like you're used to seeing in a CFD solution. So we put in some, uh, you know, viscous, you know, some volume section visualization tools. Um, and then, you know, in this case, for example, you have created just an annular section, okay, just because I'm focusing on the near wall. And what's nice is that you can actually see the, the you know, the velocity profiles near wall because of the thickening boundary layer. Okay, so this is, uh, this is actually something that is pretty cool. Um, that, you know, it's, it's, I don't know how much of this factors in other than maybe just from a fluid dynamics perspective. Maybe it's not useful for aircraft designers, but nonetheless, I just wanted to show that this is a byproduct that comes out. 
Um, and then finally, from an analysis side, it means that you can now, you know, like do these kind of uh, the, the boundary layer ingestion type analysis very nicely. So um, you take the viscous coupling, you do the solution, and we have the ability to specify inlets and exhausts. Right. So when you have the inlet boundary conditions so on the top, it's switched off on the bottom, it's switched on. And so you have the streamlines generating the boundary layer data being ingested into the inlets. And so with the volume section tools and everything, you can actually generate plots that look like this. Um, you know, and you know, there's some experimental data, which so it's quite reasonable. I mean, for the fact that it's a conceptual level tool, you should be able to also use it for some of the BLI. Okay, um, I think with that, I'll stop. Um, I have a few minutes here, so I can probably field some questions. Um, there have been a question or two that Roy's been able to address in the YouTube chat. I don't see any others immediately up, but we can give them, uh, give people a few moments to ask any questions. Okay, sounds good. Really impressive work. You guys have uh, made a lot of progress very fast. It's really been impressive. Well, thank you. It's uh, evolved over the <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I got to give credit to Dave Kenny here. He's the one who put the bug in my head about going and taking a look at what Drella did as far as expo is and stuff is concerned for viscous coupling. And so I just went back and said, okay, fine, let me see what what, <laughs> what Mark Drella did and, and what we can do. So yeah, I mean, in theory, we are not claiming any proprietary stuff here, right? I mean, all we're saying is that we've taken the stuff that is there in expo, but extended it for 3D applications, right, on a, on a panel. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's um, lots of work on on viscous coupling over the years um, by Cabessi and Besnard and Drela, as well as uh, as others. Um, whether you <clears throat> whether you do it based on streamlines or forming a, a differential equation solver, and you yeah. know the equations are parabolized, so you can even do it with a with a space marching approach that'll be really fast and basically uh you know converge in through you know through a couple of marches maybe um so yeah there's a lot of opportunities there to do things yeah i think so and i mean the the, the key benefit is i mean like the runtime it's like dramatic right i mean like you're you're talking about like seconds and minutes so i mean you, you, i mean dave has already shown for example some of the stall modeling stuff you you know we, we're showing here the viscous coupling stuff i mean it's getting to the point that you know we're competitive right with the full-fledged cfd i mean maybe you could argue against that but i mean you know from a concept if you're at the early design level i mean the tools are getting better and better we've got a question here oh roy just answered it um it was a question about concave versus convex surfaces roy said it's not limited but is there any is there anything you'd like to add about tricks there or anything special uh, so, sorry could you could you repeat the question well, the question was just if if it worked for concave surfaces and and it does, but uh, yeah, oh yeah, there's no restriction on on the surfaces here. Whatever the surface streamlines are doing, wherever they can go, we can do it. Now, the things we can't do is, um, you know, if you had like a, a, you know, like a 90 degree bend in the surface, you know, like a back of a truck or something, <laughs> you know, uh, if the flow, I mean, th this is viscous coupling, which means that it has to have a surface streamline, it has to have a boundary layer that's doing stuff on it. I mean, you if you end up scenario in a scenarios where you have like bulk separation and stuff, then we have different models for that, but it wouldn't be this viscous coupling. There's a question about um, I'll just read it directly and you can answer it. Do you identify the leading edge attachment lines to set the initial momentum thickness to or something else? Right. Well, so actually, this is um, um, this is again a leaf out of Dave Kinney's book. Uh, but um, there is actually some papers published out of NASA Ames that talk about how to compute the attachment lines using the velocity field computed from you know. Well, they used it for experimental analysis, but in panel methods you can do this. So we don't because of flight stream. You know, we don't have that information. I, I don't know, uh, Rob, if you have that information for leading edges mm -hmm. and VSP, I guess. But um, we don't have that for sure. You know, when, when by the time stuff happens in flight stream, and so. What we do is we compute the inviscid flow solution, and then we use that that paper. They're, they're, basically, they do an eigenvector analysis of the uh, surface velocity field, and that shows you where the attachment lines and the stagnation points are. And we use that to identify this thing. And I believe it's the same implementation in CB Arrow. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, that eigenvector analysis for the for the uh, attachment lines gives us the starting point for the surface stream lines. You know, I, I Dave's not on. He can't answer that. I know that CB Arrow used to use a streamline-based method, but he corrected me a couple of weeks ago, and I guess it 
somewhere along the line, he actually now does a, a full um, differential equation based method that no longer traces streamlines. So he, ah, okay, okay, all right. So yeah, so, so yes. Yeah. I have no idea how he handles that. Um, finally, there was a question, is it limited to incompressible flow or can it be applied to transonic supersonic flows? Okay, so that's a good question. So going back to my, just the slide here real quick. Um, so where I talk about the boundary layer. Okay, so this boundary layer model from Standen was actually implemented so it could do both subsonic and supersonic. Okay, so there's no technical restrictions here on this, on the boundary layer side. There is a restriction in the sense that flight stream uh, solid panel method, we don't have a supersonic solver yet. Uh, we're working on some transonic capabilities, uh, some enhancements for that. Uh, but th and there is a way to do the supersonic panel method solution. I mean, people have done it. I think, uh, what's that called? Um, uh, Woodward, and I think those guys did it back in the AP05 stuff back in the day with solid panels. So, so there is abilities to extend the solid panel methods to supersonic theory. So what's missing here is that we have not had the chance to implement the supersonic panel method solver. But the boundary layer is just in the wait, so to speak. So it's just waiting for the invisible solver to catch up. Does that, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I can clarify if needed. I think that'll do. Okay. Um, I mean, I have a few more minutes, so I can. I can. Uh, there's some other questions. I can field them right now. Yeah, yeah this is Brandon. Um, we had talked, you know, a week or two ago. <clears throat> excuse me about um, doing some of the acoustic validation against something, say, in a wind tunnel, as opposed to a uh, small scale vehicle, and uh, whether or not the acoustic stuff that you were doing would capture things like. Uh, point sources or reflection sources um, stay out in a wind tunnel or take the effects of walls into account and it sounded like at least from the um, the shielding side of things that you might have some blockage effects but not necessarily the effects of the acoustic scattering back towards the microphones from somewhere else is that a fair statement that's right. And well, yes, as of right now, that's a true statement. Uh, the uh, right now we, we we don't do acoustic scattering. It's on our list of, I mean that that's our that's our phase two activity, right? Is to do the yeah. acoustic scattering. But yeah, if you if you took the current version of the toolbox, you could probably do, you can use it for all the open rotor and open flight condition type setup. But yeah, if you have stuff reflecting off of walls and coming back into your noise signal, uh, you won't be able to capture that just yet. Sure, sure. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do want to you know, take up that offer though to at least see though uh, how how well we do. So um, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that though. Just to, just to clarify. <laughs> yeah, we can probably still get that sorted out because it's uh, you know taking a look and seeing how close is is better than not knowing at all. Exactly. Yeah. The biggest problem for us is right now is essentially getting hands on data, right? That we can contest against, right? Even for the open stuff. I mean, uh, there's some, like I said, there's the, the UH one edge rotor and there's a lot of helicopter stuff out there, right? Um, but then, you know, like if you look at UAM vehicles, I mean, I know Rob, you had a presentation, I think back at Uber, right? For um, the uh, some of the work you guys did with some uh, the CRM models, I think, with the acoustic signals, but d did you guys ever have like experimental data for any of that? We were conducting some experiments down at UT Austin, and the the intent I think is still that Professor Sirohi is going to eventually make that data uh, available as just a rotor on a test stand. <clears throat> but certainly, availability of public data, in particular, historically, you know, propeller and rotor um, acoustics has historically been focused on high disk loading, high tip Mach number. Um, yeah. Yeah. highly loaded props because that's what turboprops and helicopters have been driven towards. And so there hasn't been a lot of experimentation and a lot of data available in uh, low disc loading, low blade loading, low tip speed kind of realm where most of these UAM vehicles are headed. In particular, you know, the, the high disc loading, high tip speed, high Mach number realm is, is dominated by the tonal noise components that, as you point out, are the easy ones to calculate. Uh, whereas these UAM vehicles, where you're able to design them, um, you're able to design them to the point where you can drive the tonal noise down until the broadband noise dominates. And so it's it's almost a truism that they become broadband noise dominated. And of course, those 
those tools are not as evolved and are not as prevalent. And then they're going to be much more empirical based rather than physics based because right, you have right. the ability to resolve all the time scales and length scales of turbulence. It's just not possible. So we're we're kind of in this point right now where there's a lot of difficulty and definitely a dearth of of data on rotor noise for um, these these the the realm where UAM is headed. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel that because I mean, we we actually spent a while trying to find data that we. I mean, we, we were going on it from the naive side, right? We didn't know much about any of this stuff, right, when we started. So, we we just started going on Google and trying to see who's done more, and kind of surprised to see, um, you know, as you said, you know, how little there is for the, you know, for the props and UAM stuff. Well, you're you're the the folks at UC Davis are doing a good job. You're at the right place there. You have a good mm -hmm. partnership. Right. Okay, well, I'll stop the screen share, Brandon. I think uh, we're, I'm, I'm out of time here. Um, did I miss anything? Any other questions last second? No, you got them, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, jumping in and giving such a, a thorough presentation and, and really excited about all the work that, is, that has come over the last uh, year or two, uh, as Rob said. So uh, thank you for spending the time and, and sharing that with us. Uh, it's been a great addition to the workshop. All right, well, thank you very much.